this car is the most honest car you ever seen. It's been a dream ever since I've had it. The first time I heard that engine screaming, I thought, I gotta have one of those. For me, the cars have personality. What's great about a BMW Classic is the community that surrounds it. When you listen to that, <laughs> that's why we're here. Welcome to Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. My name is JP, and my guest today is best known for being one of the inventors of Wheeler Dealers, the famous TV show around the globe. A dealer himself, plus a really cool personality in the car world, and a true man of automotive legacy. Welcome, Mike Brewer. Oh, thank you very much, JP. What an introduction. Love it. I try my very best. Sometimes I have my moments, you know? Well, I think that was a very kind one. A legacy. I like that. It's very nice. I mean, I don't want to refer to your age because that would be unfair because this is a process we all affected by. But I have to say that, I mean, since I'm watching things on TV, I see your face and I really like that. Uh, well, thank you very much. You can't mention my age. I'm, 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 uh, I've been on television now for 25 years. So imagine. I uh, know that's a very long time. And when I started on television, I was well into my 30s. So you can guess how old I feel now. And look. You don't look old at all. Um, that's fine because it keeps you all young, I would say, right? Exactly. I've still got my hair, which is a good thing, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. So you do so many, many things. It's things on TV. It's a podcast. It's social media activities, all internet stuff. You have your own dealership. How do you fit everything in 24 hours and seven days a week? The truth is, JP, I really don't. I mean, my life is a little bit chaotic. Every day I try to minimize the amount of work I'm doing to a 17, maybe 18 hour day, but that wow. seems impossible. But yeah, we run a, a big car dealership called Mike Brewer Motors. I've got a very popular website that uh, is very hungry for my content every day, and that's called Mike Brewer Motoring. Um, We've got the TV show, which takes up at least five, if not six days a week of my time. I not only present the TV show, but I produce Wheeler Dealers as well, plus several other TV shows. And uh, we've now got an automotive podcast as well, which is another thing that sort of got crammed into my life. But there was such a demand for me to do it that we decided to, to do it. Plus, I'm the patron of two charities which require my attention and I try somewhere in there I try to be a husband a father mow the lawn and <laughs> get my hair cut you know somewhere in there there's a bit of life as well I mean I got the impression your family and friends also add to your career is that right I'm very, very fortunate, JP. I have the most amazing wife, Michelle, who has been the backbone and supporter, not only of me, but everything I've done in terms of the crew on Wheeler Dealers. She bakes cakes for him every day. Yeah. She looks after everyone that we work with. Uh, she's a workaholic, very much like myself. Nothing seems to be enough for Michelle. She's the one that always pushes for more. Let's get a podcast. Let's do another TV show. Why don't you write this series? Why don't you do that? Uh, Michelle, very fortunately, comes along with me for the ride. You know, that's yeah. that's the good news. You know, we've been together 34 years. Wow. I think we have too many secrets on each other to, to now n never part from each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so um, no, it's because of my family, you know, and I work purely to support both myself Michelle, my daughter, Chloe, plus I'm the baby of six in my family. And, uh, mm. you know, some of my brothers and sisters do need my support as well. So, yeah, it's, for me, it's all about family. Plus, you have to be passionate about, about cars. Otherwise, it would not be uh, realistic to do what you do. So it's, a, it's that the real love as well. To be honest with you, JP, I know little else other than cars. I, I'm pretty good at, you know, mowing a lawn, chopping <laughs> down a tree. Welcome to do, my world. Yeah, I can do stuff like that. But there's something about cars that was instilled in me from a very young age by my family. Mm -hmm. And I know nothing else. And uh, my passion is purely automotive. And if I'm not making wheeler dealers, writing about wheeler dealers, writing on the websites, hosting live events every weekend, then guess what? 
I'm restoring my own cars. It's what I do. I don't know anything else. I just like keeping cars on the road. Is there kind of a family legacy in cars? Uh, well, how did it all start? It all started from a very early age. My father, my uh, lovely dad, Roger, he was very well known in the custom car world. So he mm -hmm. used to, in the 1970s, he would customize cars. And custom cars back in the 70s was, you know, not as mainstream as it is today with kids putting spoilers on their cars and big loud exhausts and uh, uh, fancy paint wraps on their cars. Yeah. Back in the 1970s, it was all fabricating metal, uh, French and in lights, uh, you know, doing magnesium wheels on the car, slot mags on the car, some wild stuff like uh, taking a Jaguar E-type rear end and putting it onto a van together with a Jaguar <laughs> engine. Some really weird and, um, and strange stuff that used to go on in the 70s. And my dad was very much a part of that world. And being a part of that world, I was I was sort of forced into it. I was taken to car shows every weekend. I saw the notoriety that my father had. People would pat him on the back and say, <laughs> well done, and, you know, that looks great. However, when you have a, a summer break at school in England, you have this six weeks off, yeah. and uh, I need to go somewhere. And uh, I used to go to the workshop with my dad. He had his own garage. I'd go to the workshop and uh, I would clean, sit on the floor, hand him tools, clean the tools, put them back in the toolbox, go with him to fix cars up. Come, We'd bring parts home and work on them at home. And from a very early age, I learnt car craft and car skills without basically knowing that I was learning my future. Yeah. Um, it didn't transpire until I left school uh, mm -hmm. and bought my first car that I actually knew what I was doing. I knew how to buy a car, what to look for, how to make sure it run okay, how to fix it up, how to sell it for a profit. So I learned all of this stuff purely because I was born into it. Where did you grow up, actually? I grew up in South London, so we're very poor. We were mm -hmm. incredibly poor family, although my dad had a... Um, Uh, a business we lived in a block of flats a council estates they call them in england i'm the baby of six i shared the same bedroom with my and same bed with my five brothers and sisters wow and up until the age of probably 15 maybe 14 15 years of age when i started to go out and work i used to wear all my family's hand-me-down clothes Yeah. Um, I was wearing my, my sister's underwear until the age of 14 and uh, my sister's socks. But when I got to an age where I could communicate and talk and have have a voice, I went to work on the market stalls and uh, very quickly I learned the craft of selling on the fruit and veg stalls. I would, yeah. I would sell the ladies their bananas and their oranges and cucumbers and and I, I and I would come home as a 14-year-old kid i would come home and bring say maybe 10 pounds home at a weekend and yeah. put it on the table together with my brothers and sisters they would go and do their saturday jobs and we'd put it on the table so my mum could go shopping and feed the family you know that's how we lived i mean that's a lovely story because it shows also that all the luxury thing and the comfort we are living now in and i mean you work very hard for it obviously Uh, is to understand that this is not given and it's not that far away. We don't speak about the 50s. We don't speak about this, the, the, the 20s. Yeah, this is 1970s, 1980s. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is quite recent history. And uh, I never really earned any real money until basically I started buying and selling cars professionally yeah. and doing it for myself rather than working for other people. I realized quite how good I could be at it. Yeah. So growing up in London in the 1970s, what was the car culture like? Was there anything special on the roads that really sparked your enthusiasm? Well, that's a really good question, uh, JP, and one that I'm going to answer really simply, because in England in that time, people were driving around in Morris Miners and Hillman Minxes. That's what yeah. we had in England. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, the car culture I was brought up on, uh, in was very much that South London or London car culture of people just using a car as a way to get around. Yeah. There was no love involved in owning a car. They were there merely as a tool to use for work or to get around with family. And whether it was my dad working 
on a Mustang or it was him working on a Chevy truck or it was mm-hmm. him even, you know, a British car, like an E-type Jaguar. Uh, and I could see a different side of the world where people desired and lusted after cars. So for me, I'm fortunate that I could, I noticed that at an early age. And I thought to myself, you know, when I was growing up, I never want to, I don't want to own a Hillman Minx. You know, I don't mm-hmm. want to, I, I don't want a Humber Scepter. I don't want these hideous cars. I want something different. You know, I want to do something different with my life. But what what was your dream car at that time? Do you remember? Always, yes. I, I always remember my dream car. It still is my dream car, JP. Really? Uh, JP, I'm going to be so disappointed if it's not your dream car. Because, okay. Because BMW did buy the brand. And a dream car is obviously a Mini. Yes. Uh, my one is a 1964 Mini Cooper S. Bingo. Yes. Lovely. I just fell in love with a car. I can remember at, uh, when I was growing up, going to a car event with my dad. I was born in 64, so I went to mm-hmm. a car event with my dad. I, I think I was about 15 years of age. And I met Paddy Hopkirk and his 1964 Mini Cooper S. Wow. And it was it was a like a life changing experience. That's my dream car, and this guy that won the rally in it in Monte Carlo against a much better opposition, and he won it in this little weenie front wheel drive mini. And yes. so it inspired me so much that you know throughout my years, I've always desired to own one. But now, Mark One Mini Cooper S is running to fifty, sixty, seventy thousand euros or pounds. And uh, they become out of reach. But fortunately, I bought one a few years ago. And are you happy? Oh my god, I love it! It's not like owning. It's not like owning a car. It's like owning history. Yes. You know, when you get in it, you feel uh, it's the most connected car I've ever driven. And I've driven, you know, in my life uh, as a car reviewer, I have McLaren throw cars at me, Maserati, Ferrari, Lamborghini. Jaguar, you know, all these car companies will throw cars at me for me to review and test, but nothing will make me smile harder than driving an original Mini. I definitely could refer to that because I always remember also my my early days in car journalism, which I can't do anymore so often, which is a shame because I do other jobs, a classic driver, is that I remember exactly, you know, we have, this is we have in common. I had a dinner at the what was it yes it, i don't know the year exactly but it was in my early years so i had a dinner for the monaco history classic sitting next to petty hopkirk there you go yeah, and i mean you see first of all i had a bit of a different with his belfast accent to get yeah. that right yeah you know this always speaking very in front of the teeth yeah yep um and he was like i mean this guy Hard on drinking, I have to say that as well. I think we carried him out after the evening, but being a true gentleman all the time. And I mean, that stuck into my head. I mean, that was one of my first encounters as being invited. And you know, forget, don't forget, Classic Driver always was online. And uh, we, we, we started in 1998. So no one understood online at that time. So it was BMW Group Classic, who in the early, early days thought, ah, internet could be not too bad, young chaps, yeah. let's invite them. And this evening with Petty Hopkirk and the day next day we did an interview. It was absolutely fantastic. So I totally hear you. And I'm happy yeah. to agree on, yes, the Mini Cooper S is one of the best cars around there, even though I hardly fit in it. <laughs> <laughs> Now then, JP, let's get you another pint of Guinness, so we will. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, if I, I, I think if I, you know, if I get oiled, I might slip in. That would work. Let's see if that yeah, works. Yeah, honestly, remarkably, an original Mini is quite possibly the most comfortable car for a bigger, I mean, look at the size of me. I'm the size of a, I'm the size of an SUV, but yeah. funny enough, I can fit comfortably inside a Mini. Uh, you're right with the size. I mean, I have the size of a whale. <laughs> and I've, I, I drove a thousand kilometers together or being driven by uh, Prince Leopold von Bayern, the race driver, in a recreation of the uh, mini Monte Carlo ones. And we had a great time. It was very fun. Yeah, it was very, really like very comfy. I bet you two didn't know where one of you ended and one of you begun. If you was two of you squished up inside that car, I'm surprised you're not pregnant by <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Leopold. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> luckily, uh, Prince Leopold is a very fit and very thin sized uh, racing <laughs> driver. So that was the, I was, I mean, I was filling up 90% of the car. That I can say. <laughs> 
and I think good. also also that the performance suffered a little bit. I have to say. <laughs> Love it. Oh dear! No, Ever. but uh, that's that's a lovely story. Also, that I mean, that's very funny that we have this in common. Seeing Paddy Hopkirk, I mean, what a man! Yeah, I've had uh, and since then, like you, you know, through BMW, I've had dinner with him several times. So yeah, yeah, I got to know Paddy on a personal level. I interviewed him several times. Yeah, and God rest his soul, it was a you know a loss to the icons of the motoring world yes. when when that man passed. He is the man that inspired me to. My first car was a Mini. He was the man that inspired me to just lust and desire a mini. And people all over the world, I get asked the same question, you know, so Mike, you're this famous guy on the TV. Yeah. What's your favourite car? And they expect me to say a short wall based Ferrari 250 GTO. Yeah. Everyone expects me to say the same thing. But I don't. I always say a 1964 Mini Cooper S. That's it. Perfect. Done. And this shows again also, and I mean, we're referring to this actually literally every time, it's not only about money in this field, it's about what you love. And uh, the stories you feel connected to some cars and brands. Yeah. So that's, I think that's the yeah. secret. Yeah. Um, Mike, do you remember your first ever close deal, or let's say maybe more specific automotive deal? I do, yes. My very first automotive deal was that Mini that I bought. I bought yeah. it at the age of, uh, you can't drive in England until you're 17 years of age, but I couldn't wait. So by the time I was 16, <laughs> of course. Uh, I'd already worked my ass off on the fruit and vegetables yeah. up and down uh, the market, and I'd saved enough money to go and buy my first car at 16 years of age. So by the time I got to 17, I could take my driver's test and I could be out there in my little car. And I loved it. I bought a, a Mini 1000. It was in beige, so it wasn't the best colour in the world, but I didn't <laughs> care. And I drove that car everywhere. I absolutely loved it. And um, unfortunately, my sister's neighbour reversed out of her driveway and she smacked straight into the front of it. And uh, when she smacked into the front of it, she damaged it in such a way that the insurance company said to me that it was irreparable. So they were gonna they were gonna pay me out all of my insurance money, uh, which was three hundred pounds. By the way, I paid three hundred pound for the car, and they gave mm -hmm. me three hundred pound back. Nice. And uh, when I went to collect the check from the insurance company, because back then insurance companies were on the high street. They're not like uh, on the internet like today. I went in to collect my check and my little mini was sitting out the back in the car park of the insurance company with a dent in it. And I asked them, what are they going to do with it? And they said, oh, the scrap man's going to come and take it and it will be crushed. So I asked how much and they said, well, I get £25 for it. So I asked them to make my check out for £25 less Yeah, and I'll take the mini back with me. So I had £275 and a bent Mini. I went home and uh, the dent was on the front of the car and my dad welded on a small hook. Mm -hmm. We put a chain on the hook and we wrapped the chain around a tree and my dad just told me to keep reversing the car up. So I'd reverse it up, bang, and we'd pull the dent out. Then uh, he said, do it again, reverse that, bang, I pulled the dent out a bit more. And eventually we reversed the dent on the panel. And then because I had 275 pounds, I thought, well, now I can do some nice stuff. Like I put mini light wheels on it, mm -hmm. little flared wheel arches. I painted the roof black and the bonnet black. I changed the seat covers. I put new seat covers on it and put Sibby spotlights on the front as well. So I give it that, ra that rally look. And yes. it looked absolutely amazing when I'd finished with it. So much so that I had a friend within a few weeks begging me to sell it to him. And I did. I sold it to him for £800. So <laughs> I, this is in the, uh, the mid-80s. So I'm like, hold on a minute. I've just bought and sold a car and I've earned more money in that one transaction than my mum and dad did for the whole month. Yeah. And uh, I like this. I'm quite good at this. I think I'm going to do it again. So I used that to buy my next car and uh, and I never stopped. I'm still doing it today. <laughs> I, I mean, that's amazing. Um, and so, but let's, you know, then I think step by step came together, more deals coming in and things like this. So 
How did the growth of that business went like? Uh, well, it went really well. So I was buying and selling cars at a very early age. But at the same time, I was working in the print business. So I was actually a four-color printer. So I used to print record sleeves. So mm -hmm. I worked at a printing company in Wandsworth with my dad. My dad worked there as well. Alongside his customizing job, he mm -hmm. drove a delivery van to subsidize his income. So my dad got me a job there. And I actually printed my first ever job, Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. So wow. that album, if you're holding it, it's likely that I'm the guy that printed that cover. And I had that job for a while. That was for about two years. But there was this real pull for me to be somewhere in the automotive space. Yeah. So I, I went to work for IPC Magazines, which was a magazine group where the rest of my family, my brothers and sisters, were working. And they had a magazine called Motor uh, mm -hmm. there. So I'd become the post boy delivering the post yeah, just so I could get close to Motor Magazine and uh, keep pestering them for a production job, which I did. And then um, from that, I learned all about, you know, writing and how to talk about cars. And I looked at the guys that worked there reviewing cars and I learned all about that. But I was still on the side buying and selling cars privately for myself. And then one day a guy approached me. I was actually at IPC magazines, but I was working in their, they had a bar and I used to go and work at, yes, the magazines uh, company had its own bar. And I used I'm born to, uh, too late, called, man. exactly. It was called a social club back then. <laughs> uh, so it had its own social club and I was working behind the bar again to earn more income and uh, to support my family. And uh, this guy came in, he sat the other side of the bar for four nights running. I actually thought he wanted to date me, this guy. <laughs> but after four days, he asked me if I'd ever bought and sold a car. And I said, yes. Strange question, why? And he said, I own a fleet of garages in South London. I want you to just come and work for me. So I packed up the job at the IPC magazines and the bar the very yes. next day. Yes. And uh, I went to work at a garage in South London, Tootin in South London. And in my first week, I sold 13 cars. Wow. And I was getting 100 pounds every car I sold. So at the end of my first week, I had 1,300 pound commission, of which my family had never seen that kind of money ever. Yeah. And uh, that changed my life. That was the moment I went, okay, I'm... So I'm quite good at this. You know, this is my career path. So uh, that's what started me off buying and selling cars. And that grew very, very rapidly mm -hmm. into me starting my own business. And how did, I mean, that's the question I was waiting now for, like that answer. How did Mike Brewer, the successful car dealer, how did you become a wheeler dealer? Well, you know, just by... Remembering what my dad said, you know, mm -hmm. always do the right thing, never do the wrong thing. And do you know what happened, JP, throughout my years of buying and selling cars in London, which back then it could be a world of, you know, really dodgy dealers and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, unscrupulous dealers and unscrupulous people doing very dodgy things. I basically stood out as a person that wasn't doing that. I was buying cars correctly. I was mm -hmm. fixing them up correctly and I was selling them correctly. So much so that in 1997, you probably wasn't even born then. In, <laughs> in 1997, television went looking for a car dealer mm -hmm. and uh, it phoned at every car dealer in London. And uh, of course, lots of these car dealers had skeletons in their closet that they didn't want to expose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And almost by default, you know, most of the car dealers are told uh, the television company, you need to talk to Mike Brewer, get hold of Mike Brewer. So um, they come and found me. Nice. And how did that conversation look like? It was a funny conversation because it was a call from a lady called Celia. Celia Taylor, yeah. she phoned me about a car I had advertised. It was a Volkswagen Golf GTI. Good car. Yeah, good car. Mark II, big bumper, power steering, oak green metallic. Love that car. The best Porsche color. Yeah, brilliant car. Uh, she asked me about uh, the car. I gave her all the details, and she 
then confessed that she wasn't actually calling about the car. She was calling from a television company and she'd been looking for me and can she come down and, and film me? Yeah. And I said, absolutely not. No way. <laughs> I was, you know, being very successful. But my wife, I was with my wife then. that She was then my girlfriend. We were working together, me and Michelle, and we had a, a wonderful business and, you know, I'd already started to support local communities and I didn't want to give up on being able to support people around me because there were a lot of people relying on me. But this lady was pretty insistent and uh, the next day she just turned up with a camera and uh, she begged me. She said she'd get fired unless she went back with some film. Mm -hmm. So she begged me to walk around a car in a dealership, which was a, a Peugeot 205 1.9 GTI. Also a very good card. I think I see a GTI pattern in your career. Yeah, so I did. Uh, I used to sell lots of GTIs. Anything with an eye on the back, I'd sell it. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we walked around the car with the camera, and I told her all about it. And she said, you're amazing. And I said, well, I just did it to stop you getting fired. The next day, she showed it to her bosses at Channel 4 Television, mm -hmm. one of the big major networks in the UK. And uh, their instructions to her were, go get him. He's the next presenter, or he's the presenter of this brand new car show called Deals on Wheels. And mm -hmm. uh, she was instructed to, you know, by hook or by crook, make sure I did the job. What was the theme of that TV show? So the theme of that was quite good, actually. It was just watching. It was a, like an observational documentary where you're mm -hmm. watching people buying and people selling their cars but it would be linked by me saying this week we got a story of JP. JP's got a BMW Izetta. Uh, he wants to sell his Izetta, but can he get it sold? And there's a guy called Steve who's looking to buy one. And then we'd follow the story of the two coming together. Yeah. And I would guess what the sale price would be. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would write on with liquid chalk on the windscreen I would write down what I thought the sale price would be. And then the deal would get done. But the TV company kept pestering me and pestering me and pestering me to show the audience how I bought and sold a car. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I discussed it with Michelle at several times, and, and we both said no, because I didn't want to be portrayed as a dodgy or an unscrupulous dealer. Yeah. Uh, and I kept saying, I can't do it because, you know, people out there are going to see that I buy a car for a thousand, I spend 200 on it, and then I sell it for 1,800. And they're going to think, you know, I'm dodgy. And that's not true. You know, I have to pay rent, rates, lights, advertising, you know, all of these things. And I don't want people to think that. But they pestered and pestered and pestered. So ultimately, I did a piece with a, a Toyota Serra, which is an imported Japanese car with gold wing doors. Very rare little car in the UK. And I've heard I, about this. Yeah, Toyota Serra, S-E-R-A. I need to look that up. Yeah, it's a great little car. And um, I found one, and I showed the audience how to buy it, how to tidy it up. So I changed the wheels, painted the tyres black, clean the interior, clean the glass, fix up a little scratch on the bodywork. I showed the audience how to do this, and then I sell the car on the program. Mm -hmm. And um, that spiked the interest of a tiny little network uh, that had only been running for five years called Discovery Channel. And, uh, very dis tiny. They, very were. they were tiny, Discovery yeah. Channel. Biggest media company in the world today. But yeah. back then, they'd only been running five years and they were they were used to filming gorillas in mountains and people digging for treasure. Yeah. They found some producers, two lovely guys called Dan and Mike, and uh, they invited me out for coffee. And we sat down and uh, we basically wrote Wheeler Dealers. Wow. I mean, what a story. Yeah, who would have thought that 20 years, 20 years later... Yeah. I'm still doing it. I'm still doing the same shows. <laughs> so Wheeler Dealers was actually invented for you and with you as the main character. 
In German, uh, by the way, it's called the Gebrauchtwagen Profis. I mean, a title, it couldn't be more German, uh, I have to say. I prefer wheeler dealers, but anyways, that's the German language. So I can imagine your audience is quite huge around the globe. You must have enormous number of viewers, right? Uh, yes. So it has over 200 million people around the world. Uh, crazy, what, huh? I know, it's crazy. Well, in fact, the latest series has just aired, and I just got the figures. So the latest series just aired across Europe. So it hasn't even played in America, Australia, China, Japan, all of those territories, or South America. And it's big in South America. And uh, just in Europe alone, it had just over 100 million viewers just in Europe. I mean, that's ridiculously much. It is crazy to think this little weenie car show from that little weenie genesis of an idea with the Toyota Serra become this monster, you know, that now, you know, I, I'm still making. Yes. I'm, I'll never stop making it by the looks of it. They won't let me. So to get this straight, your first TV show was Deals on Wheels on Channel 4, then followed by a move to Discovery Channel, with the Villa Dealer show, where you give instructions on buying, restoring, and selling cars. Um, but you also reviewed cars on TV, didn't you? Uh, fortunately, in between the two, I went and did another big TV show on Channel 4 called Driven, Yeah, which is where I reviewed cars. It was like a version of Top Gear, Yeah, where I went and reviewed new cars. And uh, that, so I got to learn very good television craft. I got to work with some great editors, great directors, and I got to learn the process of television very quickly and what the audience, what you need to tell them or what you don't need to tell them. And um, uh, that's put me in a, you know, in a position now where with Wheeler Dealers, you know, all I've got an amazing team of people working with me, but, you know, decisions flow through me. Mm -hmm. Although there's much more intelligent people work on the show than I am, but all decisions seem to these days flow through me uh, because they trust my judgment. And your judgment is based on the one thing your father said to you, which is yes, very cool. Yes, it's always do the right thing, never yeah. do the wrong thing. I love Correct. that. It's yeah. So, yeah. It sounds so simple and it's very complex if you really think about it. Does the TV show has influence on your car dealing side, or do you still do it as you've done in the past? No, in fact, it's completely different now because the world of car dealing today is a completely 100% reviewed business. Yeah. So today, people won't go and buy a cup of coffee without reading a review on the coffee shop before they True. go and buy a cup of coffee. So you're uh, so right, absolutely. Right, so the car dealing business today is a 100% reviewable business. So when I put Mike Brewer Motors together with my wife, Michelle, I put together a team of people and I convinced them that we need to, don't worry about if we sell 100 cars a week or one car a week. It doesn't matter. Yeah. As long as we are 100% reviewed as a positive experience, yeah. the rest of it will happen. Yeah, You do the right thing, you don't do the wrong thing. Every customer that comes in, you greet them, you service their needs, you make sure they get the best deal they possibly can, you follow up with them after to make sure that they're happy. If they're not, change it. Bring the yeah. car back, change it for another car, we'll give you your money back, it doesn't matter. But that drove the business to become the highest-ranked dealership in the United Kingdom. Wow. Uh, so independently, we're judged, and our review ranking is 99.9%. Um, did your perception for cars change? Is that your taste in cars changed after Wheeler Dealers? Not really. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate I'm in a position where I get to drive all these cars. You know, mm -hmm. I get to test them, restore them, fix them up. I get to fall in love with my little babies. You know, I've restored yeah. over 500 cars on television. But, you know, I'm a car dealer, so it doesn't matter. One day I've got it, next day it's sold. So you read, really, <laughs> I mean, that's the, to, to be honest, the moment where emotions get too much into it, it gets the wrong way. Um, there's a very important car collector who has uh, 200 plus cars in his collection. And he once said to me, uh, JP, do you know what's the difference between a collector and a hoarder? And I said, no the price he is willing to sell a car. 
And I think that's so <laughs> wise because he said a hoarder will never, never, ever sell a car to the right market price. He will always make it so expensive that no one will buy it because he can keep it. And he can say to his family, I tried. I tried everything. No one wanted the car. But a collector has a living collection. So cars come and cars go. Oh, JP, you've you've described so many of my close friends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've got so many close friends who are just utter hoarders when it comes to cars. But no, everything with me has a price. I find it very difficult to sell my Mini, I must mm -hmm. admit. I've got two cars that are my go-to cars. It's my little 64 Mini. I also have got a 19, uh, it's like a Hot Rod 911 that I built. Yeah. I absolutely love it. It's, a, it's an 82 SC, but I've done a lot of work to it to make it like a GT car. Yeah. That car is my go-to car as well. And I I'd mean, find... there comes the father's legacy through it, right? Yes, of course. It's, it's it. hot-rodded. Like yes. But trust me, JP, if you stood up and said, I'll give you 100 grand for the Mini, sold, yeah. it's yours. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's as simple as, uh, I'll go and buy it again. You know, yeah. it's, as, it's as simple as that. I love it. I mean, that's great. <laughs> When you watch the Vida Dealer show, and I mean, you're doing this for so many years now, you always have the impression while watching it that you and your team just have a blast. Is that just an impression or is it really that you guys have fun? Uh, right. While well, shooting the show, well, I'll be honest with you, JP, we laugh every single day we laugh to the point of tears and you uh, see that that's the secret of your success i tell you uh, well we want to enjoy ourselves and we're you know we've got to entertain jp i've worked with the same film crew for 20 years wow so simon my sound recordist john and nick my two cameramen my two dops yes. have been with me for 20 years so it shows you the brotherhood that we have that nobody Nobody ever leaves. Once you join, if you fit in, you'll stay. And uh, there are many a time when I think either one of us or all of us has fallen around somewhere, you know, half naked drunk somewhere in <laughs> some part of the world. So, yeah, I mean, there's lots of funny things that happen on the set of Wheeler Dealers. Super. Now my new presenter, Elvis, it's really funny. Uh, one of his first nights out with me, Yes. he woke up the next morning with green great big sunglasses on and <laughs> sleeping next to an inflatable crocodile <laughs> so welcome to the world of wheeler dealers <laughs> absolutely the wd experience it is <laughs> i love that i mean you know that's the basic story of the show you find a car you restore it and you sell it as a spectator you can really see how much enthusiasm you put in finding these cars buying them to the right price, selling them to the right price, doing everything right in between while restoring it. Uh, was there a very special project to you if you look back? Is there one particular car, like the Ford Transit project, for example? Uh, yeah, so we fixed up a Ford Transit on Wheeler Dealers. It's a Mark I Ford Transit, the car that I almost learned to drive with, with my dad. Yeah. Like, my dad was a delivery driver, I told you. Yeah. And uh, I would sit beside him and he would let me change gear in the in the van. And, uh, yeah, well, I, I fixed one up on Wheeler Dealers, a German, ex-German fire engine. We did a right-hand drive conversion, painted it back the original colour. It was such an amazing van. Uh, it was pretty clear and obvious to everyone yeah. that I had totally and utterly fallen in love with it. And I sold it. I sold it at the end of the programme to a van dealership who put it on display. Yeah. Uh, but then I had a live event come up later on in the year, one of the big classic car shows in, in England. Yeah. And I phoned him and I said, can I borrow it to put on display? And in all the time it was there next to the live stage where I was working, by default, every single person said, you were crazy to sell that van. Uh, so at the end of the event, I told the two guys that I told it to that I'm not bringing it back. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> whether it's they like it now. or not, it's mine. Exactly, and uh, and I gave them a profit on it, and they uh, they're very pleased. I see, um, Mike. I would like to come back to the UK car culture, to the strong UK car culture. I mean, it was here when I learned about track days. It was not in Germany, but it was the UK friends from like from boarding school that they they said, "Let's go for a track day." So they didn't have no clue what a track day is right in that time. Um, so I think the car is very well woven into the general English culture. 
Why do you think that is? Is it because you've been always producing cars yourself in the country? Not the best, obviously. Lots of trouble, usually serious. Speaking of Lotus. Um, <laughs> so all these kind of things. You, you are correct, JP. We're a car producing island, you know, like Germany. We're a car producer. And so uh, you're always going to be five people that have been proud to hold on to our heritage and to, yeah. to make sure that our heritage stays and, and keeps going. Yeah. In fact, right now, there is a big classic car movement called the Everyman Classic. Uh, yes. The Everyman Classic being those cars of the 1970s that we hated, like the Austin Maestro and yeah. the Austin Legro. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, these were cars that everyone hated back in the day, but now all of a sudden, you know, people want to celebrate those cars. And it's because we're an island, you know, we're an island, uh, we produce cars, uh, we exported cars globally around the world, and we made some good cars as well, you know, cars like the MGB, MGA, Rolls-Royce, Aston Martin, McLaren. Yeah. Genius. Ben Bentley. I know most of these companies are now owned by German companies. Uh, but yeah, we did export some amazing cars around the world. Okay, Jaguar, I think it's not something I like at the moment. That's just a personal thing. But Land Rovers, I'm big in, uh, owned by Tata and doing also a great job. I mean, the new Range Rover looks fantastic, in my opinion. I think the Defender, the new one, is also a nice car um, getting this one. So it's um, it still is very British. And who cares who owns it? Yeah, but JP, how sad is it that uh, Jaguar Land Rover have decided to drop the name Land Rover? So yeah. uh, I just think that's one of the most ridiculous. That's, yes, you're it's right. It's a ridiculous decision. Uh, they yeah. now just want to concentrate on their four pillars, which is Jaguar, Defender, Discovery, and Range Rover. And uh, to lose the name Land True. Rover, they feel that it's no longer a desirable brand. But um, I disagree I'm, I'm, completely with that. I as disagree. Well. I think the, yes. the motor impress everyone in the world disagrees. As an Englishman, as a proud Brit. Wherever I've travelled in the world, and I've been around the world a couple of times now, whether it's in the outback in Australia, South America, North America, all across Europe, wherever you land, you'll always see that Land Rover badge, whether it's on a 100%. Defender. You're, yes. and, and it's a little it's a little piece of England that is in a different territory around the world. And, yeah. and to think that we're going to lose that, I think, is really sad. Let's talk about good things then and not like the sad things, uh, even though it's uh, it's also part of our world. Um Mike, what comes next? Celebrating our 20th year. So in 20 years, uh, you've seen me buy and sell cars, you know, in California and all across the British Isles. Yeah. And in my other series, Dream Car, you've seen me trade cars in India, Australia, South America, Dubai, wherever. Um, well, there is now a plan afoot led by me, uh, I hasten to add, to make the next series of Wheeler Dealers down under. So nice. um, we're looking at doing an Australian special. Some uh, Holdens. Uh, some Holdens, yeah. A couple of Ford Falcons in yes. there as well. And yeah. then I'd also very much like to do a Japanese version of Wheeler Dealers. Um, I'm in for that. Love it. Uh, yeah, and look at the Japanese market. And then we're going to make our way across Europe. So we want to do yeah. – um, we actually might want to make some episodes, the whole episodes in Germany – a few episodes in Poland, a few episodes in, in Italy and in France where the shows are, have got huge audiences. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think the next series of Wheeler Dealers is going to slightly change because we're taking it on the road. That sounds amazing. So, Mike, I'm very sorry. Time runs up. Oh, I was enjoying that so much. That was, yeah. a really, that was a very nice interview, JP. You're not the only one who enjoyed it. I did as well. So thank you very, very much for taking some of your most valuable good, which is time, sharing with us. We really appreciate that. It's the only commodity I've got left now, JP, is time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, uh, I've just got the, because I'm out by an hour today, Yeah, I've got a production meeting, believe it or not, right now. So I've got a production meeting in five minutes' time with the office. You see, uh, I felt that. Mike, thank you very, very much. It was 
an absolute fantastic uh, conversation could go on for hours. Uh, for those who tuned in, thank you very much for joining half an hour, hour, whatever, how it will be at the end of laughter and fun and lovely insights of the life of Mike Brewer, his career, his beginnings, and hopefully long, long time for the ending. Thank you very, very much. And that was also joyful. And if you like what you hear, please don't forget to subscribe to our little podcast and also give us a star rating, leave comments as usual. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you and see you hopefully soon. Yeah, I'll say my usual words. Ta-la! Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>